All right, so here's the uh, the most entertaining COBOL project. You go to COBOL and you can use a real IBM server here. This is the real IBM server. They give you free accounts at this website, pub400.com. You have to sign up. And in order to do this, this thing uses EBSIDIC, which was the encoding before ASCII. And it uses a really obsolete old terminal called a TN something, TN5250. And in order to run an emulator for that thing, you have to use an old version of Linux. I spent, as you saw, an hour or so trying to install it on Debian 10, and it won't install. You really have to get Debian 9, which I did. And when I did out Debian 9, I was able to install this really old version of LiveSSL so I could install the TN5250 emulator. And after all that, this is your reward. You get this menu where you can now control your IBM from this crazy uh, semi-GUI and you have to move from field to field with tab and use the function keys to move around. So it's really a blast from the past. So um, just tab to move to the password field, type in your password. I already did that. I put in my username and password. And now you're forced to change your password. And now you have the main menu from which you can control your mainframe. So there's a video that explains how this works which is, it's pretty mind-boggling how to operate your way around in here. Um, and uh, you have a library on the server. So it's files library. You can get everywhere you go by going down this tree tree directory. So I select four. That's files. Then two for libraries. Then one to work with libraries. And I have... Now you have the name of your personal library. Now on this page, you press enter. And now you see your libraries. And see, I have a Sambound1 library on the server, which goes at my username. You'll need that name later. All right. And now there's a flag there if you get this far. Now you have to use RPG, which is the language to control servers, which you have to use before you can use COBOL to... Uh, so you get back to the end. To get to back to where you were, you hit F3 three times to get back to the main menu. And now it's 411. 411 to work with files. And now uh, I want file star all and your library name. So I put star all here and I hit tab. And now I put in my library name. Okay, and now enter, okay, enter, and now I'm in my library, and as you see, I have a whole bunch of COBOL things I previously put in the library. So I'm going to start with option one is create a new file. So one, then tab takes me to here, and it's going to be hello uh, r2, I'm going to call it, and then you have to put in the library your library, you won't have the ability to write anywhere else. And then enter. And now, um, select file type. You want source physical file. Way down there. There. You go there and um, enter 1 is how you select that. And then I think it's enter. Yeah, enter. Now you're creating a source physical file. And by the way, one thing you can do is you can learn these shortcuts, CRT, SRC, PF, to go to this page directly, which is what you do when you're more cool than using this tree structured directory. You memorize all these six and eight letter garbled things. So now that I'm here, I make my record length 112, which for some reason is what it has to be to fit on old line printer paper, which is what this is all about. And then my member is going to be hello.rpg, but I changed it to something else. Uh, hello underscore r2 dot rpg. This is an rpg file I'm creating. Oh, it looks like I've seeded the length or something. Okay. I'm going to call it hello2 dot rpg. Uh, okay. That appears to be the limit. And uh, now enter. Okay. And now I have this hello2 thing. All right. Now at the bottom in messages, File hello r2 created. Okay, good. 
Now I can edit the member. So edit a source file is for F3 to return to the files menu. Okay, F3 and then 4 to edit a source file. And now the source file is my hello 2. Hello, uh oh, I think I'm in trouble. Hello R2, I think is what I called it. Then my library is Sam Bound 2. Source member is the file inside there, which I think I made it hello 2.rpg. And then source type is RPG LE. There. I think that's it. I, and I don't know if I got all that right. We're going to see. Enter. Okay. The edit page appears. And it totally didn't appear, so I fouled it up. So I got to do it all again. I think I'm not going to keep trying to do it live. If you can somehow keep it all straight, this is the part that is maddening. You now cannot paste in data line by line. It is, you have this beginning and end of data here. And I had incredible trouble on this screen. This is like crueler than VI or Nano or anything I've ever seen. Um, what you have to do is type 14, um, as shown in the image above, or is it I4? It was I4. I4 to insert four lines. Then you get four blank lines. Now you can go type them in one by one. But you have to first do I4 to make the blank lines. And you can now write hello world. And it is very painful. And if you hit the wrong key, the whole thing freezes. And you have to press Control A and F3 to unfreeze it. And uh, anyway, if you can somehow type in that file, you can press Enter to save the file. And then you can compile it and you can run it. And then you can do it with COBOL. It can be done. And in principle, you can actually get like a file upload client, but it has to be an EBC DIC file upload client. And I was never able to get one of them working worth a damn. <laughs> but this is what people really do. And so anyway, this is like learning how this was done like decades ago, which you can still do. But there is a modern alternative. It is just unbelievably cost $900 called IBM Rational Developer. This is the equivalent of Visual Studio for COBOL. By the way, you can do, there is something called COBOL for Visual Studio, which might be great too. But anyway, you have to get Rational Developer and you can get a trial version because it costs $900 for the real product. And you can install this on a Windows machine. And then you can, after quite a chore, you can actually manage your COBOL machines on the server from this thing. Remote Explorer getting, Remote System Explorer getting. And then you can actually make your programs in some modern thing like Notepad instead of having to go through that very awful terminal TN5250 thing. <laughs> now you can actually like uh, edit things in this GUI environment, enter code here in a friendlier system, and send it up to the server from the menu. So it's pretty awesome. You can run things on the server this way. But anyway, if you want to actually see the joy of using a mainframe, you can do it there. And I think uh, when you're done with this thing, I think it's control Q to get out. Uh, this is COBOL 8. Um, uh, I, somewhere I figured out how to get out. I'm thinking it's control Q, but I'm not sure. Let's try control Q. Yep, it's control Q to get out. Anyway, I wanted to show you that. <laughs> it is very difficult. It took me quite a while to get anything done at all. But I eventually managed to get like five or six programs running on that little mainframe. And then I wanted to measure how fast things ran on the mainframe. And that took me like weeks and I never got there. It is, if you want to say how much time it took to run a program, it is incredibly difficult to find on a mainframe. It is super complicated. There are big, thick telephone page books full of how to manage the resources on your mainframe. There is no simple answer like, you know, how long did it take to do this one program that would like multiply numbers a million times or something. I couldn't find any way. I wanted to do a test and show that things running on a mainframe were faster than things running on my VM in, in that uh, other COBOL environment. 
but I couldn't find any way to get a simple answer on the mainframe. It's all far too complicated. Anyway, that's the joy of a COBOL the way it really should be. <laughs> yeah, uh, Fernando uh, responded to what? I don't know. Uh, whatever you asked has vanished, Fernando. You had mentioned how to get a copy of the scoreboard script. Oh, sure. Will it conflict? No, no. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, it, the scoreboard. Let me point that out. It won't conflict with anything. Uh, here's how the scoreboard works. If you go to any one of these, submit flags, get this scoreboard. All this is is like a few PHP files that you run on your server. <laughs> this is all the scoreboard is. And here's the instructions. You just have to have a... Um, a Linux machine connected to the internet with Apache. Install Apache and PHP. And then you install the CTF engine with git clone. And then um, all you do is open your server's IP address. And it's all just running on whatever server you put it on. It won't conflict with any of mine. That's an old version, but it has most of the important features. The only thing I think missing from the instructions that confused some people was um, that you have to remove the default index.php that, um, that Apache puts there, or that's what you'll see. In fact, you know, we got an hour. I could just do it here. Let me do this. I may have to update this. Let me set up another one. So if I use my own Linux machine here. I'm which sorry, I, where did you say to go to, 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 to get this scoreboard thing? I just put it in the chat. Uh, but you can oh, get, thank you. yeah, but you can get it from any of these submit flags pages. It's at the bottom of every one. Get this scoring engine. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, let me just do it right now. Let's see, because as I remember, there's one step where people got confused. So here I have a brand new Debian nine machine. I might as well use it. So. Can you record this? What's that? Can you record this? I couldn't understand that. Can you record this? I can I record this. Oh, I guess I could. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. That's good. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, good. So let me go back to one of these pages. Sure. Okay, so start. Oh, looks like.